everyone for being here today. Oh, we're recording. Um, thanks for investing this time in yourself and, and your business. It's a worthy cause. Uh, my name's Kat. I'm the Influencer Marketing Lead at Get Your Guide. Um, and before I introduce you to our special guest, um, I will just give you a little intro into why we're here today. So this is actually our first workshop that we've opened up to all of our partners. So we have our affiliate partners, and our Instagram community partners, um, or perhaps you're already in both groups, which is great. Um, so our travel community, if you're not yet aware, is for nano and micro influencers on Instagram. Um, and as part of the community, we offer benefits like sponsored experiences, uh, networking events, uh, giveaways, and of course, workshops from industry experts, such as we have today. Um, and uh, of course, we also have a very successful affiliate program uh, where you can earn commissions by your blog or social media um, for every booking that you make with your Get Your Guide links. So if you are interested to hear anything more about either of these programs, uh, we'll send around an email probably tomorrow uh, to everyone so that you can see all of our offerings. So, but whichever group that you're coming from today, um, our goal here is still the same, which is uh, to support you as our partners uh, at every stage of your content creation journey. So that's why we're here. Um, and a wonderful host, Matt, who you probably know better as Nomadic Matt, will present for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I will let Matt tell you exactly what he's going to be sharing with you today. Um, and then at the end, we'll have the all important Q&A. Uh, so this is your opportunity to ask any questions. Um, if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, just pop them in the chat. Um, everyone is automatically muted because there are a lot of people here. Uh, we will uh, re go through them at the end, as many as possible. Um, we're going to try and finish on time. So anything that we don't get through, if there's a couple left, uh, Matt will try to answer them via email uh, in the next few days. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Matt. Thank you very much, Matt, for joining us today and sharing all of these insights. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Uh, can you see me and hear me? Thumbs up if you can. <clears throat> Great. Uh, so today I'm going to really talk about uh, monetization. That's what this is all about, right? We all want to make some money. Um, <clears throat> life is expensive. Travel, need money to travel. So I'm going to go over what I do to monetize our website, talk about failures I've had, lessons you can glean from that, and then we'll, we'll uh, take some questions. And then we can go get dinner or lunch or breakfast or sleep wherever it is you are in the world <clears throat> and we'll do that so uh without further ado let's get to it okay well i don't know why that's not hold on there we go uh so i am nomadic matt online real name matt katniss uh i started my website in 2008 without <clears throat> any plan or really anything more than i just wanted to earn some money to keep traveling for one day more you know, I had just spent 18 months traveling around the world. Uh, I had come back, and of course, it sucked coming back. Uh, I'm sure we can all relate to that. Uh, I had a really boring office job. I'm sure we can all relate to that. Uh, and so I started my website as a way to try to get freelance writing work so I could spend one more day on the road. I had visions of being a guidebook writer. Um, <clears throat> and so I was like, well, what are you going to do to get work? You got to have a website. And so the original thing was really just an online resume. Flew back to Asia and I ended up teaching English for a while. And I really just started building spammy, for lack of a better term, spammy websites uh, <clears throat> for AdSense. You know, back at the time, Google was pretty unsophisticated. And you could build a website on, say, training a beagle uh, and just think of a bunch of AdSense and um, rank it on search. and and make some money that way and so i did that for a while <clears throat> yes i did have one on raising a beagle i also had one on growing corn i've never grown corn in my entire life i just paid some guy to write the content <clears throat> um but that was actually really helpful because i learned a lot of seo through that stuff um <clears throat> it wasn't until a couple of years later that i became a full-time blogger in my website was earning enough money for me to live off of. And it wasn't until five years after that, that I hired my first full-time employee. Now we are, you know, 
seven figure company with six, seven full-time employees. We just hired a couple more. So I'm not sure the current count. Um, and we're still growing, you know, we're doing tours. We got a lot of products coming out this year. We're doing physical products, um, <clears throat> making an app, a lot of stuff happening. So I don't know why this doesn't, there we go. So how we monetize and, you know, we don't monetize every way possible because there's just some stuff that is not like a core fit for us. But here is basically how you would monetize your website. Affiliates, ads, products, sponsored content or <clears throat> sponsored gigs, uh, consulting, uh, tours, and freelance writing. So I'm going to go over the major ones, uh, talk about what we do, how that breaks down, uh, lessons learned, tips for that, and then talk about failures and how that has shaped my business over the years. Uh, so this is roughly uh, how our revenue breaks down. As you can see, affiliates like Get Your Guide um, really account for just about half our revenue. Uh, then ads are about a quarter and then products are which are books, tours, events, um, guide, electronic books, the things of that nature I, I group together as products, anything we've created. Uh, and that's about another quarter or, or so. So you can see affiliate revenue is a big focus of our income. And then, you know, so we spend a lot of time focusing on SEO, which I'll explain a little bit, because that helps both the ads and the affiliates. You get more traffic, get more ad revenue, more traffic, more affiliate sales. So SEO is a big, big uh, focus of what we do. So affiliates are probably one of the best ways to monetize a blog. And that, you know, <clears throat> and you can do this as with a small audience too, because it's really about monetizing the traffic you get to a page. And so, you know, how you really want to do affiliates <clears throat> is really just eat people's head over with it with constant links, a dedicated post for each company, add a PS at a bottom of your blog or an email, and really sort of never leave a stone unturned, right? And so SEO is very important for this because <clears throat> you want a page to rank really well. For example, we do a lot of hostile world affiliates because we rank really well for best hostels in so-and-so. And so Google also wants to have content authority, it wants you to have content authority. So if you rank really highly for a lot of, um, actually better word is subject matter authority <clears throat> for hostels already, anything you write around that subject, Google is going to say, well, he's already kind of an expert on that hostel subject. So if there, he's writing more content on hostels, we will rank it easily. So it's really good to focus sort of on a core like subject matter around affiliates uh, or a couple of core subject matter affiliates. So Google just identifies you as that. You know, For example, we don't really rank well for gear, right? I mean, I have all these backpack posts and you know gift guides and all that. But we're, we're first page, bottom first page, sometimes second page. <clears throat> you know, whereas somebody like Expert Vagabond, Matt Karsten, or Will from the Broke Backpacker, they write a lot of content around gear. And so they tend to outrank me a lot more on that. And so they're, when you're thinking about affiliates, think about subject matter um, expertise, right? If you can sort of own one subject matter in your niche that will really help you grow your affiliates around that. And so that way you're grabbing that traffic and then you want to have, you know, dedicated blog posts for everything, right? You know, the best tour company, you know, the best uh, 
hostels in F, the best tour company in France, the best tour company in Paris, and you know, and then have something for the best walking tour in Paris, then even narrower a review of that company. So you're really owning that whole funnel down because affiliate marketing is really just about lots of links, having that dedicated post, that dedicated review called Unboxing the Mystery, and then just having links for everywhere. Survey after survey of our audience has shown that if given the opportunity to support us through clicking the link, they will do that. But people are lazy. Um, and so you have to put that link in their face constantly. You know, you always have to remind people, hey, if you want to support this website, here's our links. Otherwise, they'll forget. <clears throat> and so what does that really look like? As you can see, you know, on the one side, we have an example of our hostel post. You know, we have a review of hostels and then we have a big link. So the link isn't hidden. We have a big button, book this hostel now. You want to make those links really obvious. An example of our insurance, you know, visit the site. You, know, you really want to have, and that image of the safety wing and all those other logos, 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 sorry. Um, I talk a lot, I stumble I, uh, over my words. <clears throat> Um, those are also links too. So if somebody clicks that, that will take them to the website. You know, here's a case study of Get Your Guide. You know, this is our first year with Get Your Guide. We figured, it'd be, you know, we're making about a thousand bucks a month, you know, with, we haven't put as much max effort into it, but we are growing that. Um, uh, and you know, we have our things to do in Paris. And so on all those tours, you know, we put five to seven links in uh, and we're constantly experimenting with widgets. Where's the right number? Where in the page it is? How do we call that out naturally? You know, affiliates are really about a numbers game, right? If you figure a good conversion rate, you know, it's between one to 5%, depending on what it is, right? And how much is that friction? Is it an easy sale? Is it a long lead time, <clears throat> but let's just say 3%. We'll cut the, split the difference. So that means, right, if you have 100 visitors to a page, you're going to get three people to book, right? So you really just have to scale that top of the funnel. And you want to create as many opportunities for people to get into <clears throat> that funnel and click that link as possible. You know, we, you know, we put Get Your Guy everywhere now. You know, we are creating content specifically for growing this number, right? And so, you know, our goal by mid-2023, um, that's the year we're coming into, is to triple this number. And so, on a monthly basis. And so, that really about creating content. And in travel, it's also about, thinking about seasonality, right? Europe was super hot. Now we're going to go to Australia, New Zealand, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, peak season. So <clears throat> always creating that content around what is hot at the moment and also sharing your affiliates on social media. Because just because you have a big following on Instagram, right? You know, doesn't mean that they are clicking over to your content right? They might be looking at you for inspiration and then Googling what to do in Paris and coming to me. So thank you for that. But what we have found often is that, and you might see this too, people will text, email you or DM you and be like, hey, what's your tip for the best, you know, tour in Rome? And it's like, a whole post on that did you not even bother to click over to my website because of course they didn't they're just going to send you a dm and so we just kind of link that content out to them but often in our stories as well as in the content we provide uh <clears throat> we remind people like hey here's some updated blog posts here's some updated content are you going to 
Europe this summer, here are some posts you should know about. And so you're always trying to remind them of that as much as possible because social media is really good for inspiration. Blogs are good for money, at least for affiliates. Ads, um, <clears throat> for a long time I was anti-ads, uh, but I think now people are so used to ads online that you should put ads up as soon as you can. Um, I was very fearful that um, if I put ads up, I would lose a lot of my readers because we had such an ad-free website for so long. Uh, and I'm like two people complained and that was it. And, you know, so I would say if you're going to do ads, you know, try to do so in a, in a very minimalist way that balances the user experience in your site load time with your need for revenue. Because Google does look at, you know, your website's load time, but also like, you know, do people stay on your website? Do people click back? And if you have a bad user experience, because there's just ads everywhere, and a perfect example of, of that is every food blog known to man um, is just like, you want a recipe for asparagus? Well, let me tell you about the history of asparagus and then add, 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 add. It's a terrible user experience. Um, you know, and so you kind of want to have that balance, but do not be afraid to put ads up on your website, you know, thinking like, oh, people don't like it. I mean, nobody likes ads, but everyone understands that free con ads are the price we pay for free content. Uh, products. I think products are one of the best way to monetize your website. You're safe from algorithm changes. You get to keep most of the profit. And you have more control over everything. And so people, people want to support you, right? If you ask your readers, will you support me? They will obviously say yes. But you got to give people a way to do that. And that, you know, you know, comes from the lower end of the funnel with like an ebook to the higher end of the funnel with selling a tour or consulting. Um, but if you think about COVID, right? And, and if you think about influencer marketing, you know, those two things, right? Everybody during COVID was like, oh my God, I lost all my money. <clears throat> And we were not immune from that. We also saw a big revenue drop. But if you have products you create, and if you have an audience you have built, you are much more insulated from those global, you know, emergencies in some ways. Because having a product means you have passive income. Affiliate marketing is the same way. Ads the same way too. Whereas what, what I'll talk about next with sponsored content requires you to give away your time. And so the people who are hurt the most during COVID in terms of what we do uh, in online content creation were the people who traded their time for money. You're doing a, a campaign with, you know, visit X. Whereas if you had a course or something you could sell that was sort of electronic merchandise, there was an easier way to be like, hey, audience, you know, can you support us? A community like Patreon. And so I always, always, always harp on this that, you, you know, you are a business, right? You know, think of your business the way you think of a pizza shop. A pizza shop is a business that has employees, they have a product, they think about customer service, getting people to come back, you know, profit loss statements, all that jazz. Um, that is you. You are running a business and a business sells something. And so and you need to sell more than time. You can sell information through affiliates or whatever. 
you got to sell something. And so having a product is really, really important. You, you want to think about a, a product that leverages your expertise, creates values, and fills the need of your reader. What's that need? I have no fucking idea. And if you don't either, just ask them. Be like, hey, I'm thinking about creating something that's useful for your travels. You know, what, are, what do you feel like you're missing? You know, we do annual reader surveys to figure out what are their current pain points in the travel booking and experience process. And then we create products around that. Um, and so that's really the birth of a lot of our guides, our itineraries, our courses, um, the tours, you know, uh, events. And it's just to kind of ask people what they're looking for. You know, when every audience is really different, right? You know, what people, what my readers want are going to be super different from what your readers want. And so sometimes when I tell people you need to create a product, they'll be like, I don't know what to create. And so the best way is to survey your readers to figure out what their pain point is right now. And that could be anything from, you know, I, I just really wish I had a guidebook um, to, I really need a, a great backpack to, I wish I had a, a tour company to creating itineraries, which I put back on this list. You know, my friend has a lot of TikTok videos about itineraries and people are like, oh, I wish I had that in one place. So she created these like $5 PDFs, which she sells um, really cheap, easy thing of just all her information, easy design, design PDF that people can just download to their phone. So <clears throat> definitely create products. Moving on to sponsored content. I have mixed feelings about this. Um, I still grapple with it, even though we started to do it. Everybody knows you need to eat and nobody feels bad that you are, you know, this is brought to you by our sponsor so-and-so. The, the, my advice to you and sometimes people think I'm, you know, an old fuddy duddy for, for still thinking this way. But survey after survey of people has shown us that it's not the sponsored content they hate. It's A, it doesn't feel like a good product fit. And B, it's really blatantly an ad like, hey, I'm all about travel, but do you like this coffee? I use this coffee when I, you know, nobody, everyone knows you. Never even heard of that brand before they gave you a bunch of money. But it's also the frequency. If everything's an ad, nothing feels authentic. And at the, at the end of the day, you need to create learn from me content, not look at me content. And so people need to feel that they're getting value from your channel, that they are learning something because there's a million channels out there on Instagram and TikTok and the blogs. So if all this is, is pretty pictures of, you know, like you, like the quintessential Instagram photo of somebody looking away on a scenic backdrop, and then it's like all these ads, you're not going to really see great growth and you're not going to see people stick. And, and that's because they're not going to be able to be relatable, you know, you need to be relatable. You need to be imperfect. You know, that's why that new platform Be Real is really growing because people want realness. They don't want the polished nature of what, of what so many creators have become. So if you're doing sponsored content, really make sure that it's a good product fit and you can do authentic and it's not all the time. Right. Like I see so many people just like promote so much random crap that and then they're complaining like, oh, how come Instagram is not showing this or how come my audience isn't inter interacting as much anymore? It's because you lost the realness that drove people to you and drove people to you in the first place. So that is sort of my thoughts on monetization. 
since we're short on time, I will um, move this along. But those are the main ways I, I think you should you can monetize a blog. Uh, you know, obviously, I didn't get to freelance writing, uh, a bunch of other things. But those are sort of the four pillars I think will drive the majority of your income. And so through that journey over the last 15 years of trying all of these, I've obviously, obviously has have fucked it up. Um, mistakes were made by me. Um, you know, because the life of an entrepreneur is up and down. You're going to throw a lot of spaghetti against the wall um, and not all of it is going to stick. So <clears throat> first, let's talk about my book and what I learned from that. In 2013, I released uh, my first print book. It's called How to Travel the World on $50 a Day. I thought it would do awesome. It did not. It was te did terribly. Um, I guess not terribly, but it would didn't like light up the charts. Um, <clears throat> and so, in 2015, we, I got the opportunity to make a second edition. And in this process, I I changed what I viewed as the three failures of the first one. First, I never really articulated how different the book was from the, the blog content. Second, I didn't really reach out beyond travel folks to, to help promotion. And third, I didn't start early enough. And so, you know, the book, it was like two weeks out and I'd be like, hey, you know, uh, Bill, do you, you want to start promoting this book? And there's people like, well, I got content already lined up or I, you know, I have this podcast so I can start doing it months from now. That doesn't really help when you're trying to launch a big book. And so in the second edition, I hired a market, marketing uh, team to help me branch out of travel. We started the marketing process six months before. Um, I did a massive road trip to support the book. And I was very specific on what you were getting in the book that was not on the website. Because... You know, our chapter on backpacks is like 10,000 plus words, whereas our blog post is only 3,000. So clearly there's more content in the book. And so I was very, very aware that I needed to articulate what that extra content was. So people would go, okay, I'll get the book. And so the lesson here, and I really wish I had a, a slide for that, is a couple of, a uh, couple fold. First, if you're going to create a product, start the marketing process early. It's super, super important to, to, to plan well so that when the product launches, all your guest posts, your interviews, your podcasts, um, the social copy, the images, it's all lined up, pre-scheduled. You don't need to think about it. It's like the machine has been created. Um, in planning, there is profit. Um, second, if you are creating an informational product, you really want to highlight why this product is different than your free content. Because people are going to go, well, why would I buy this product if you give away so much information for free? That could be around travel. That could be around itineraries. That could be around blogging, whatever tarot card reading, astrology, I don't, whatever it is you do, you got to clearly define how this goes the extra step, how your free content is step one and this is step two. And third, hire help. If you have a product that you think is really good for outside travel and you know your peers, but you don't know what people outside your peers, hire help. It's going to cost you money up front. But, you know, in the long run, you're going to make money. I spent my entire book advance right on the marketing for this book. Um, because they give you money every edition. I spent all of it and then some on this. But this edition became 
not only a New York Times bestseller, it all that extra marketing really put me on the map as a travel expert. It differentiated me as more than just a blogger. Um, <clears throat> it I, I increased my network network exponentially. You know, this was when the book took off. This was when our website took off. And so <clears throat> really hire help. We as even if you're making money, you look at things as a cost, it should be looked at as an investment. I invested in my book more money than I could really afford on the hope that it would be successful. And it was because that money I spent on the first go around was totally wasted because I didn't hire help. I didn't plan and I didn't highlight uh, how the book was different. <clears throat> Second failure, too many shirts. Years ago, I created an app. Um, and this app was sort of like a, a way for people to track their expenses. As part of the app, I ordered a bunch of shirts. And people like, I really like this shirt. It said, keep calm uh, and travel on. So we ordered a whole bunch of shirts. Now, this was before you had on-demand uh, printing for shirts or mugs. You had to pre-buy them. And they would store them for you and fulfill all the orders, but you had to pre-buy them. So I bought like a thousand shirts, thinking like, ah, oh, we can sell these. Like, we did not sell these. I ended up offloading these at cost um, and probably lost some money on it. I mean, we had them for years. In fact, eventually when we moved uh, WeWorks, we had like two boxes sitting under our desk that we just gave to charity. Somewhere... There's a homeless guy in New York City with a keep calm and travel on shirt. Um, <clears throat> and our biggest mistake in that was going back to what I said about products, not asking your audience what is their need. None of my audience gave a shit about shirts. You know, it was not a good product fit. But because so many were sold with the app and people said, oh, well, I really like these shirts. I thought there was greater demand than there really was. When if I had just sort of given out a general survey of like, if I order these, will you buy them? And not only that, asking people to pre-commit to it so you can really see. So right now we're doing a, we're creating a travel journal so people can journal while they travel. So I ordered some um, and then I, ask people to pre-buy them before I ordered more. Um, I was like, if we don't sell enough, I'm not going to just put in you know, another $20,000 book order. But we sold enough to hit what we needed for a proof of concept. And so if you're creating a product that is not digital, it's always good to ask, how can you... It's always good to ask your audience to make sure they want it. Because you want to know that the money you're putting in there is going to be worth it. My biggest mistake is not starting an email list soon enough. Email is forever. Google well, changes their rankings. Social media apps come and go, but nobody misses an email. It requires active participation. You own your list. And you can create deeper personal connections. Plus, it's easier to sell products and affiliates and tell people about the new content you created through your email. The biggest mistake most online uh, creators have is they don't start an email list. So there's no way to pull your TikTok followers or your Instagram followers, your YouTube followers, from there onto something that you can own so that the next time you create a post about the best tour companies in Rome and that's filled with get your guide links, your audience can see it. You just shoot out an email. You know, there's a reason all big companies want you to sign up for their email list. There's a reason all big creators are like sign up for our email list. Nobody's like, don't do that. Follow me on Instagram instead. You, know, you really want to own your property. If you think of yourself as a business, 
you're just renting ad space on Instagram. Really what you own as your business is your email list. So you really want to have an email list. So you really want to have an opt-in everywhere, um, you, you pop-ups, calls to actions, post about it often on social media. Twice a week, we're often just telling people, sign up for my email list. Um, entice readers with freebies, free PDFs, sign up. People love free stuff. Um, email is super, super, super important. You know, you have a single call to action in them. Um, the biggest mistake was not investing more in email before I started blogging. So in summary, one, you don't monetize a website, you monetize readership. So you gotta get readers. So focus on growth and, and content. Um, and actually I'll add another mistake in here. Um, networking. I, I Virtual hand, who doesn't do a lot of collabs? I'm guessing out of the 178 people on this call, most of you don't do collabs. And if you do, you probably do it with other travelers. Huge mistake. You're kind of in competition with your peers in a way. Um, there are colleagues, but competition. It's a weird niche. Network outside of travel. The greatest growth I've ever had in terms of growing my presence is when I collaborate with people outside the travel industry. Find a industry that is closely related to yours. If there's a Venn diagram, there's sort of like an overlap. For me, that's like finance bloggers because people who like to save money also like to save money on travel. So it's easy for me to make that pitch. Find something related to that because so many people don't collaborate. When they do, they just collaborate with you know other creators in their own industry. That you end up having this overlap of audience. The real way to like grow is to go outside what you're doing. I think long term, uh, put your audience first. Remember, it's learn from me, not look at me content. Don't assume any preferences. Ask them. Start a newsletter. I don't know why this says one, 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 one. I think it's a PDF uh, thing. Um, create your products uh, and be mindful of sponsored content. And remember, I've learned from every mistake I've made. I don't think of all that money is wasted. You know, sort of what Edison said, I have not failed 10,000 times. I just found 10,000 ways not, not to do something. You know, it's that 10,001 time that hits. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I will take questions. If there are any questions. I mean, I see all those chats up here, so. Thank you so much, Matt. That was amazing and great. glad that we have some time for questions. I'm sure there will be a lot coming through. Um, let me start from the first one here. Uh, okay, so Jess wants to know, what is your process for promoting new products? So this kind of goes back to our, our thing about creating a plan, right? I will write down a marketing plan. Uh, I read Jeff Bezos' biography once, and it was really interesting. Uh, but he said he always had, whenever someone pitched a new idea, you make him write a five-page paper on it, right? And in, in business school they talk about creating the marketing plan and so for promoting that new product i always write a plan detailed plan who do i want to reach what are my goals what's the timeline for that who can i connect with what like and so i will create you know a three month you know marketing plan where it'll be like okay you know if i'm going to have a new book out where am i going to promote that you know, who do I want to reach? What's an ideal podcast? What, who do I know? Who is a maybe? Who is a reach? If you're creating something that is like tours, right? So like we have tours now. For that, you know, I'm not going to go on a podcast promoting my tours. Not, it's not really something people are going to say yes to. But I want to reach the maximum audience. So I'll create, you know, maybe a one-month plan of like, 
what's the email campaign going to look like? How often am I going to do that? How much? How often am I going to do social media? What's the social media going to look like? What's week one? What's week two? What's week three? What's the messaging? You really want to have that lined up so that it's not like promote product and then figure out what to do. You want to figure out what to do before the product launches. Makes complete sense. <laughs> Okay, Imani would like to know uh, what are some of the platforms that you used for building your blog in the beginning? <clears throat> I have Wix as a website, but don't know how to integrate a blog into it yet. Uh, I don't use Wix. I use um, uh, WordPress. I don't think Wix is a good website uh, uh, for content creators. Use WordPress. Wix and Squares, Squarespace. Uh, are very good if you want to have a very simple website. Let's say you're just a photographer and you just needed a couple of pages. Uh, but if you're going to start building and selling your own products online, I just really think WordPress is, is much better able to do that. Fair enough. Convert. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rachel wants to know, how often do you send a newsletter or email out to your list? So we have an onboarding funnel where if you sign up for my newsletter today, and if you haven't, uh, we have a landing page on our main page. You will get onboarded into uh, like a welcome funnel. That's like, here's some of our awesome content. After you're done with that welcome funnel, you will get an email every Tuesday. Nomadic Maths Travel Tuesday. Nice. Okay. Estella thinks that not many people read newsletters, but <laughs> perhaps they She's do wrong. for you. You're, Estella, you are 100% wrong. Okay, and Oliver replied to say, newsletters are still the most effective marketing method. Um, okay, there's some comments on that. WordPress, okay. Are you afraid that your ads will compete with your affiliates? Um, no, never really crossed my mind because they're different revenue channels and you know, you're getting paid either way. And most of the time, for example, get your guide runs ads, right? So, you know, if there's get get your guide ads, it's going to be like sort of a, a general thing. Whereas that that doesn't mean on that page where let's say I have France, right? It's going to, the get your guide ad is not competing with my insurance affiliate link, right? Or vice versa. But also. You know, if somebody really wants a specific tour, they're probably going to click on the link over the ad. So it's sort of never really crossed my mind. Plus, you get paid either way. Yeah. Uh, what software do you use for your emails? Uh, we highly recommend ConvertKit. Um, I've tested all of them. I'm actually, I just moved back to ConvertKit from Active Campaign. I think ConvertKit is really good for creators. Cool. Uh, on the collabs topic, are you doing two-way link exchanges or just asking websites outside of your niche to add your link? So you don't want to add links. Adding links are a very antiquated way of like, hey, like how many people spam your inbox? Like, will you add this link? What you really want to do is do either a guest post or some content exchange, right? You know, if, if you don't know them. Now, obviously, sometimes I'll text my friends and be like, hey, I need a link. Can you toss this somewhere? But if you're going outside to say, you know, my website, right, in finance, and you had never met me before, if you really want to pitch, like, here's something I'm offering you that's a value to your readers. Link swaps are just an old way of doing SEO that's very ineffective. Um, most creators don't know what you're up, know what you're up to, and they don't want like they just don't want to play that game. But if you're like, hey, can I write a piece of content for you? Sure. Every creator has one problem: they don't have enough time to create content. Everyone needs content. Everyone needs content. So if you're providing people with useful content, they know you're going to put a link into it, and that's fine because it's a win-win. But a link exchange is not a win-win. Got it. Uh, Chloe asks, when you do your annual surveys, how do you decide whether you should write that topic uh, as a product versus a free blog on your web website? Mm -hmm. I think about what people are 
what's the pain point? And can that be a product or an affiliate post? So if somebody is saying, you know, I don't really understand travel hacking. How do I get points and miles? And that can be a blog post as the start, but that's a really detailed subject you can go really in depth on, right? And so I could turn that into an e-guide, which we do, we sell an e-guide, right? And so I look at how detailed can I go on that subject? And is it going to be something that's very top end or I can like create a small a sample and then get people into a deeper thing? Blogging, right? I mean, I create a whole course on just marketing alone. So how detailed can you get is, is one of the term, determining factors that we think about. Okay. So Natalie is asking if you could provide examples of whom to contact for collaboration. I assume uh, they mean um, what, like how you actually find um, brands or, you know, people to collaborate with. I don't think they're asking for specific people. <laughs> um, Google it, right? So here's a wait, wait, like find your topic, right? So we have a spreadsheet and I have a, and it has thousands of names on it, right? Uh, that I've collected over the years. And it's like travel bloggers, podcasters, you know, YouTubers, uh, influencers, uh, media, website, you know, like I, I will be like, okay, if I want to get on a bunch of podcasts, I don't really know a lot of podcasters. So I will Google like top podcasts and travel, top podcasts and finance, top, you know. Um, but plus you also follow people, right? You're, you exist in a vacuum. So think about the people you follow, put them on your list. Then think about the people that they follow, put them on your list. And so once you start going down this rabbit hole, you just start adding creators left and right, right? Think about every podcast you listen to, you know, go to Apple, look up podcasts you open the their app click on whatever niche it is those top podcasts that's who you're reaching out to right and so you can get um a lot that way just by like we just do searches and then over time you you know you start meeting people and networking people and people recommend people so like if you have a podcast or friend you don't know a lot of podcasters. Ask your friend who they would recommend. Because usually podcasters listen to other podcasters, right? You know, TikTokers know other TikTokers. Bloggers know other bloggers. And so using that one friend as a gateway into a whole field is very helpful and time-saving. Okay. And just to summarize, I guess, a question from Imani Dumbler. Um, she says, how did you reach out for collaborations in the beginning? So I guess just jumping on the end of that question, did, did your pitch change over time? Yeah, you know, uh, the more established you are, the easier it is to get a yes, right? Um, you can get introductions from friends, but a lot of cold email. Like now, you know, we still do guest posts for SEO. But now I can just, you know, I have friends, and I can just ask people and people know the name. Um, but, you know, start with your friends. You know, again, you don't exist in a bubble. Um, you know, succeeding online is a collaborative experience. You know, you need links. You need that. You need to piggyback on people's audiences. So start with your friends and then work your way up. Cool. Um, Amanda writes a lot of content Sorry, a lot of itineraries are travel guides on her blog, uh, which is free to the end user. What additional types of information would or do you include uh, to sell that information versus the free version? Maybe probably make it into an ebook. You know, think of everything you can need. So let's say it's like a travel guide to Botswana. I don't know. I just thought about that country. You have an itinerary. Well, you know, it's probably like, Three to 5,000 words. What can you do to make that 15,000 words, 20,000 words, and that you can wrap it up into a, a cheap ebook? Um, could you 
then also create just use it as a lead magnet, right? Uh, click here to download this blog post as a PDF, right? You put some, you make a nice little PDF, and then you get their email, and then on that back end, you're sending them an email like, hey, if you're going to Botswana, like, don't forget to book your flight. Boom, here's the link. Don't forget to book your tour. Here's the link. Travel insurance. Here's the link. So a product can also be a free product that is then used to sort of monetize your back end, you know, you know, through affiliates, right? So like we have a lot of free products, all our events, but the goal then is to get emails that can, we can then send out to people for affiliates. Got it. And how do you ensure that uh, affiliate widgets don't slow down your site? I find that wid widgets and AdSense really drop the page speed. That's very true. So we're very judicious about that. Oftentimes, if we have, say, something like a booking widget, like we have like travel insurance, I will throttle down the ads on that page so that one, it gets to the booking widget sooner. Um, and then we're not competing, but also it um, speeds up the page speed. Sorry. Okay. Um, so someone, Alice, is working on articles for the blog, which will be out soon. Email marketing is so important. You're right. Um, thanks for sharing your expertise with us. We'll use it soon. In the meantime, oh, it's not a question. Sorry. It's just a uh, mention. Okay. What are your thoughts on disclosing affiliate links or ads and the best way to do it? This is in regards to websites. Well, ads are kind of disclosed uh, already. In terms of affiliate links, it's actually really good to say, hey, these are affiliate links, because that gives you an opportunity to say, you know, if you click the links in this blog post, you're helping to, to support and keep this website free. Right. And so uh, there are, I don't know where you are in the world, but all the sort of legal disclosures around uh, ads. Um, in, in affiliate, you know, and, and just telling people about that. Uh, but I, it's not a detriment. Like you don't need to hide it, right? You know, because people will support you if given the opportunity. So if you can tell somebody, hey, if you click these links, you're going to support us. That's a good reminder to your audience. Oh yeah, I, that does work. And so they'll go through your link. And no extra cost to you. Like we say that, all the time we it's it's in every blog post and on our resource page um okay as a team of one part-timer uh, how would you recommend breaking out my time to maximize um yeah yeah live and die by your schedule like schedule everything um you know, let's say if you have, let's say part time or so you got a full time job, right? Go to Google Calendar, lock off your your regular work day, and then what's left, like okay, like when can I, you know, and actually plan your life too, put in your free time there, and then that can give you a sense of like, okay, here's when I can work on my blog, and then after that, say okay, like this one day, I'm just going to do this one task. Right. What's the one thing I can do today that will move my website forward? And just focus on one thing. So like I tend to write on Friday and Saturdays. No emails, there's no calls. Like, you know, some since some of my team is remote, by the time I wake up on Friday, they're done for the weekend. It's sort of like a, a good, peaceful time I know I have. So my writing gets done at the end of the week. Um you know, midweek, I tend to focus on the email stuff. Um, and I, I chunk my time, like I'll do social media, like I'll pre-write my social media one day. And so just really focusing on one task per day allows you to feel like you're getting something done because there's a billion things to do. So if your to-do list is a billion things and it's that billion things every day, you're never gonna feel like you're moving forward even if you are moving forward, you won't feel that way and that will discourage you from continuing. 
Okay, since we just have a couple of minutes left, I'm just going to select a few more questions to go through. So we have still quite a few. Um, okay, one that I think everyone will benefit from. How long did it take for you to start monetizing on your blog? And did you ever say no to a collaboration because you thought it wouldn't work out? I say no all the time. Do not be afraid to say no. At the end of the day, this is the long-term game. So where a lot of people go wrong is that they take money now because they need it. Uh, so they go on this trip and then suddenly they don't have time to build their email list. So they go on another trip and they and you get on this hamster wheel where the only way you're really monetizing is more collaborations. But the more collaborations you do, the less time you have to build your own products and create passive income and create affiliate related content. Um, so always say no. I mean, I say no all the time. I think I care more about the long term success than money in the pocket right now, because over the long term, I'll earn more than if Zyrtec gives me, you know, 10K to promote allergy medicine. Um, as bad as my allergies are, it's not a good product. Okay. Um, and so to the first part of that question, it took me about two years until I made enough money where I could quit the day job. Don't quit your day job until the side job pays your bills completely. Good advice. Um, okay. Uh, from Paula, uh, how many views per month would you recommend to start before starting to put ads? Uh, the second you qualify for ads, join that network. So um, I, I don't know what AdSense requirement is, but uh, Mediavine, I think, is 50,000 views a month. So 50,000 views. Okay. Okay, I'll go with um, final few questions. Um, which platform works best to send traffic to your blog? Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, other? In terms of just traffic to your blog, Facebook pages. In terms of a website that's, I know this wasn't your question, but uh, in terms of just building an audience, Instagram and TikTok are much better. Okay. Um, or building an audience, but in terms of just you want raw clicks, Facebook. Okay. And let's go with this one as the last one for now. Um, how do you pick the themes that you'll write about? Is it based on Google Trends? Yep. Keyword okay. research. So obviously I write about where I go, um, and that's just based on where I go. But if we're looking at creating affiliate related content, we think about keywords. And again, subject matter expertise. We have like 50 posts on hostels and we will just keep writing until I have a post on every place possible because Google ranks us really easily for hostels. Um, you know, we're growing our tours, you know, content. So we'll think about what don't we have already? So for travel insurance, I pretty much have written everything you could possibly write about travel insurance. So a lot of that is just making sure we stay on top. Um, but we'll also think about, you know, I mean, if we really want to write more content around Australia, what are people searching for that we don't already have? And so with that, we'll, we'll, we'll look at like uh, SEO and, and trends. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, we have, there are a couple more questions, but um, we will try to categorize them and then maybe Pat can have a look uh, in the next days. Um, but for now, we are out of time. Um, so I just want to say thank you very, very much to Matt for being here today, for offering his skills and advice. Um, I'm sure that everyone is going to take away something very valuable today. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined. This is a really great turnout and it's great to see all of our partners together in one digital space. Um, so until then, we will be in touch. Um, maybe if you'd like to say goodbye, <laughs> Matt. Thanks, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks Find so me much. on Instagram if you need anything else. <laughs> and email. And email, yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good day, evening, night. <laughs>